give away ownership and become a good gardener. Uh, the next thing comes from Josh Redcalf that I really love the idea of allowing athletes to build their own house. And the story goes something like this. Master builder at the end of his career goes in and says, hey, I want to retire. And the boss says, I need one more house, one more house. And he reluctantly said, okay. And so he cut corners, outsourced work, hurried through it, got done in record time. And he went into the boss and said, I'm done. And he said, well, that house you just built is your house for all the hard work that you've done for, for my company. I think this is exactly what happens to so many athletes these days where, where they're building their parents' house, their pleasers, or they're, they're trying to please their coach. We need to convince kids to build their own house, and when that happens, I believe they will be better athletes. I'm also huge on the metaphor of being like a gardener. You work the soil, you hope you find good seed, you water it, you pray for sunshine, fertilize with tons of bullshit, and then hopefully there'll be a harvest, and then it all dies and you till it up and you can't wait till the next season. If you coach like this, I believe that you take the pressure off of you to create a product. I'm just a gardener, that's all I do. Hormesis, pain and fatigue is the enemy. Uh, I put this guy on here, he had turf toes, so he never practiced. He didn't practice for the last five weeks of the season as a junior, and still was all state. Practice is overrated. I never trained tired, sick, sore, injured, or depressed athletes. If this was my coach's philosophy back when I was in high school, I would have never practiced. I was beat up every damn day made me tough I guess but overturning is like burn the stake you can't undo the damage I don't know how long the damage lasts but it's a long time when I was young I used to take a hundred bucks to the casino and try to win a thousand and I'd win I'd lose a hundred you know every single session I was up 20 40 50 bucks at one time or another at every single session, but I was not disciplined enough to walk away when I was ahead. Most coaches are like that guy turn, trying to turn a hundred bucks into a thousand and they ruin kids. They burn the stake. Hormesis is basically treating, well, in track, hormesis is the idea that training is like a poison. But it has its benefits if it's used in small doses. It really stimulates. There's a lot of poisons that we take as medicines, but we take small amounts. We microdose. The typical hormesis curve says that after a certain point, things go downhill. So I always want to be in that first part of the graph. Always. Microdose, 40 minute workouts. Nothing more than five seconds. Not ever ruining the next day. And every bone in your body will scream, especially if you're a football coach. By the way, all these things are applicable to football as well. That I'm not working hard enough because it's a religion. It's a religion that we all bought into. And I'm the world's biggest heretic. I'm a sports atheist when it comes to outworking your opponents. We want to get on the line, 80% in shape and 100% healthy. Never the other way around, ever. Never let today ruin tomorrow is one of my go-to statements. I mean, my, <laughs> every day ruined tomorrow when I was a, an athlete. Every day ruined tomorrow. Think about that. Any fool can get another fool tired. The worst coaches in the world have the hardest workouts and the most conditioning. In sprint training, tired is the enemy, not the goal. That's one of my go-tos. By the way, feed the cats is not a recipe. It's a group of ideas. It's, it's, they are ideas that 
that whatever you decide to do, if you stay within the parameters of feed the cats, things are going to work out. Pillar 11, RPR, I won't talk much about this, but these two guys really changed a lot of what we did. Uh, and Chris is having a, uh, a session on Saturday that's separate from this clinic. But we've had no hamstring injuries in the last five years, zero. And I've had my five fastest teams. Coincidence, I don't know, I think we run faster with RPR. Sprinting is more neurological than muscular. This is where I can really start talking about uh, the, over, <laughs> the overrated nature of weights. Uh, this coach got 1,085 retweets saying that lifting weights will get you faster, jump higher, more flexible. For This is prevailing thought. <laughs> He's wrong, but that's, that's prevailing thought. I've never had 1,000 retweets, ever. This guy, I don't know him, but he's slow. He is slow. There's no question about it. And the reason for this is because there's two types of muscle fiber. There's red and there's white. Red has blood. White has hardly any. Red is aerobic. White is anaerobic. Red is slow twitch. White is fast twitch. Lots of mitochondria in the red because it's aerobic. Hardly any mitochondria in the white because it's anaerobic. What gets worked and grow in the weight room? Red. White get, no. So what he's building is red fiber here. Just doesn't make you faster. He's real good at pushing a car uphill. If that's what you want, do this. Franz Bosch, one of the world's greatest sprint scientists. Uh, this is hard for weightlifting people to accept, really hard. Uh, in the search of, for infinite strength, Chris told the coach and father of this jumper that's now at the University of Notre Dame, 24 foot long jumper, Connor is strong enough. Talk about a heretic, a blasphemous statement. But infinite strength is not like infinite speed. Two really different things. Infinite strength starts to work against you. Pillar number 13, keep guys like this away from your sprinters. I love this guy, he's my distance coach. I love him, I mean he's a great guy, but keep him away from your fast kids. You gotta forget about Allen Webb, endurance, volume, mileage, pace, VO2 max, sit and kick, threshold runs, Joe Newton, pasta dinners, team retreats, cross country. 5K triathlons, race strategy, EPO, drafting, getting boxed in, fartlek, intervals, Jack Daniels, junk miles, LSD. I feel like we didn't start the fire here or something. But yeah, don't t treat your cats like dogs. That's one of our problems in track, by the way, is that distance coaches get all the jobs because they're such good people. I mean, they are solid Boy Scouts now. And, and the edgy guys are the sprint coaches. They don't get the jobs. So track is dominated by distance coaches. Running is not sprinting. I'm always hearing, it's the same thing. Well, this is the 1500 meters right here and none of them have their feet off the ground. This is fast, efficient running. And they, yeah, they could probably run 48 flat in the 400, but this is not sprinting. It's fast running. That's what it is. Uh, Charlie Francis said that most sprinters are unmade rather than made due to inappropriate training. There. By the way, if, if you've got little kids, don't sign them up for soccer. Sprint. All that run around may tire them out, but all their fibers are going to turn red. They're going to be slow. Uh, you're born actually with red, white, and transitional. We want to push transitional white. We want to push the transitional to fast twitch. And how many six-year-olds do anything fast twitch? They're always signing up for the slow stuff. You don't have to memorize this, that's a nice thing. Uh, Bortsov won two golds and he smoked cigarettes. And so Jesse. 
In my past 20 years, my sprinters have never run a lap in practice. Our girls team in Illinois, they were separate, boys and girls. Our, that's all our girls team do. They run laps, sometimes with the baton, sometimes without, but they're always just running laps. That's what they do. The last pillar of essentialism, it's all about simplification, trying to go big on the things that are important, like max speed and rest. Max speed and rest. That's the only three things I can think of. Sprint mechanics, run real fast with spikes on, and jumping. Those are the only things that make you faster. <sighs> uh, World Speed Summit guy said, Coach, how do you get it all done in 40 minutes? I said, shoot, I'm looking to try to get it done in 30. I mean, I'm constantly looking to eliminate stuff. I'm not trying to add. If you have not read Essentialism, it's a life-changing book in my opinion. Good stuff. Well, that's weird. My stuff did not show up there. Oh, there it did. Uh, so if I tried to practice Essentialism, the four main things would be this. We want to sprint as fast as possible, as often as possible, as fresh as possible. We want to record, rank, and publish. We want to accept small gains, and we want to promote, promote, promote. So if I had, uh, if I had to put up one slide and talk for 60 minutes, with one slide, I'd put that up. And I'll end with this. This is John Hyatt, one of my favorite artists. There's only two things in life, but I forget what they are. Great line. And so, so ever since I heard this song a long time ago, I've thought about what are, what are the two things? And I've come up, especially as a, as a coach, I've come up with these two things. Love and encouragement. Uh, those are the two things. By love, I mean love of, of other people, love of what you're doing, love of, I mean, it's, it's a passion. You know, that, that, that has to be one of the two. And then encouragement's kind of like love too, because you're picking somebody up. Stuff that Coach Jones talks about, that good leaders pull people up with them. And I'll tell this story. This is my son, Alec. They had... They thought they had the best track team in the state five years in a row. And they got second twice. Little things would go wrong. And they would leave just totally demoralized. And finally in 2015, they won it. And this is the moment where Alex, 300 meter hurdler, who had been out all year due to RPR, we got him back in the last 10 days of the season got third in the hurdles and they clinched the state title. And this is my son, he said he felt like Andy Dufresne. Is that, is that the guy from uh, the movie? Andy Dufresne? Shawshank, right? Where he swam through a mile of shit and came out clean. That's the way Alec felt. And when this happened, Alec and I hugged and we both cried. And later that day, okay, they went back to the south to Edwardsville and celebrated and my family the other five of us went back north and we celebrated for Alec and I'll never forget what my daughter said she said I've never seen Alec cry and then my son Troy who works in advertising downtown Chicago said there's nothing in my job that will ever bring me to tears and I and I always remember that because it is, it is truly his love of the sport, his love of his hurdler, and his love of his father, his love of fellow, uh, the fraternity of coaches, is truly love that caused him to cry. And then, this is 117 years of coaching up here. 117 years of encouraging kids. And if you look up encourage in the dictionary, it literally says to give courage. And that is such a powerful statement to me. You give courage to bring somebody out of their fear of judgment. You give them courage to perform. The guy on the left coached for 32 years. Uh, he was a World War I veteran. Won 650 basketball games, three state championships. His name's Gay Kintner. He was my father's basketball coach. My father, the guy in the middle, this is him at age 22, 
when he just got a head basketball job at a tiny, tiny school in central Illinois. My dad was an unwanted child, born, to, born in poverty, government housing, uh, working poor. Uh, he had <laughs> the poor people, uh, his poor parents had twins, and then a year later had him. He was an unwanted kid. But at the age of 15, Gay Kintner gave him a basketball and said, holler, wear it out. You're going to be one of my great ones. My dad went on to coach 47 basketball seasons. 47. In a weird twist, Gay Kintner died on the bench during a basketball game. Three days before my first birthday in 1960. My dad, when he graduated, not graduated, when he retired from coaching after 47 years, three months later he found out he had five blockages in his heart. Open heart surgery. He would have died on the bench the next year. I'm sure of it. Matter of fact, he always told me he wanted to. He wanted to die on the bench. There's no question that I am coaching today because of this World War I veteran. And what can we learn by that? What we can learn is encouragement is our legacy. And that legacy will echo in eternity. I know that's a big statement, but it will truly echo in eternity. That what we do by encouraging kids is really what it's all about. And I think it has something to do with love too. Thank you very much.